the R8 is about to die. And I don't think it's gonna go quietly into the night. Yep, you are looking at the last ever petrol powered Audi R8 supercar. Whatever replaces this as Audi's top model will not have a V10 in the back of it. It will have an e-tron badge and be full of batteries and electricity. So what I thought we'd do is we'll have a good look around this limited edition R8 GT. And of course, we'll take it for a drive, but we'll also answer a question. Is this the most exciting Audi road car ever? Or did perhaps the R8 peak first time out? You see, just because it's a sad day, doesn't mean it can't be a fun day. Congratulations to all you Top Gear nerds, because you have already realized this is not just any Mark I Audi R8 V8. Oh no, OY07 MHL was Audi UK's original demo car. And that means that this is the very machine that 15 years ago journeyed down to the hallowed tarmac of the Top Gear test track, battled Richard Hammond's Porsche 911, and then blew Jeremy Clarkson's mind. This car is a sweet spot. This car has inherent rightness about everything. So let's break it down. The engine, there is a rawness to this V8, but there's authenticity too. There's no fake active engine noise being pumped in. If you wanna really enjoy it at the top of the rev band, closing in on 8,000 RPM, you've just gotta go up there. The control weights are beautifully balanced. There's something almost Lotus-like about that. And the car has this wonderful sense of agility and poise and yet it's so comfortable we're on some pretty dodgy spanish back roads today i can't believe how compliant it is oh. and then there is the six speed open gate manual gear shift with a gear knob that appears to be some kind of microphone from the future how did audi come from nowhere and give us one of the all-time great manual gearboxes I mean, I have no doubt you'll probably be able to hear that while I'm driving along a road that I don't know, using someone else's R8 and trying to concentrate on talking to you, I will fluff one of these gear shifts. I'll get my heel and toe wrong. There you go, way too much throttle blip on that one. But because you're having to use mental capacity to change gear, because when you get one right, it is so, so satisfying. Well, let's just say that the paddle shift that I'm gonna try later on is gonna have to be pretty good to top this. After it had finished being thrashed by journalists and set a lap time in the claws of the Stig, this R8 wasn't put in a museum. It was sold off into the real world. It was actually in pretty ropey condition when Audi bought it back a couple of years ago, with some aftermarket wheels, a few scrapes, and a tired interior. Though Audi has restored the car mechanically, I like that the signs of its life are still here to tell its story. The seats have sagged a little, and the steering wheel has been polished by thousands of turns. It proves that this R8 did what the R8 was invented to do, be a proper, everyday, usable supercar. And what a joy it would be to use one of these things every day, because it is still so fresh. To me, it still looks modern on the outsides. Maybe those dot LEDs in the headlamps Look a bit dated now, but everything else still looks absolutely crisp and modern. So is this interior as well. I think I find this less annoying than a lot of modern Audis with their touchscreens. Got proper buttons everywhere and the materials still feel high quality. And though the performance barely qualifies as a supercar these days, I mean, what's 414 brake horsepower? I mean, this has got a similar 0 to 60 time as a modern S3. An RS3 would have its trousers down and a Porsche Cayman could probably have this thing for lunch. But as just a whole, it is such a well-sorted bit of kit.
If you weren't even born when this car starred on Top Gear first time around, what you need to get your head around is just what a shock it was for Audi to have pulled this thing off. Remember that Audi is pretty much half the age of Mercedes, Porsche or BMW, and while they all had motorsports heritage dating back to before the Second World War, Audi was always the young pretender. Yes, okay, nerds, I know the auto union existed before the war, and yes, Audi had dominated rallying, of course, and made its name with the Quattro, but I still don't think that Audi was taken seriously as a maker of driver's cars, not next to the decades of legends that we'd had from Mercedes and AMG, the BMW M division, of course, and that's before you get to Porsche. It was this car, the first R8, that gave Audi the, the confidence, gave them that launch pad, that springboard, to become the kind of premium badge monster that it has grown into. And I simply do not think that as many people would have ended up lusting after A1s and yearning to own Q3s if this car had never existed. Audi evolved its R8 quickly, dropping a V10 into the back, cutting the roof off for spider versions and taking it racing with huge success. In 2015, the soft lines of the first car were replaced by the much more angular second R8, and this is where you might argue the R8 slightly lost its way. You see, as the R8 grew up from its first generation to evolve into this car, well, it got bigger and wider and a lot more powerful, but also techier and more grown up. For example, no more manual gearbox available and certainly no entry level V8. Now, of course, that V10, as you're about to hear, is still one of the world's great engines, but I might argue that some of the old R8s entry-level kind of underdog character was slightly lost but there's absolutely nothing entry-level or underdog about this though is there one of only 333 r8 gts that will ever exist and no you can't have one very sorry they're all already sold and the people who have bought one well they're basically getting a whole heap of carbon fiber ready carbon fiber splitter carbon fibre front flicks, carbon ceramic brakes with lightweight forged wheels wrapped around them, carbon mirrors, carbon side skirts. This car doesn't have the lighter bucket seat option ticked and it also doesn't have the 20-way adjustable coilover suspension. I've looked at the plaque inside, it's number 57. Avoid it on the used market. What else do you get a standard then? Well, back here, there's a massive carbon fibre diffuser, carbon fibre swan neck mounted rear wing. Audi says that this car, thanks to some of the lightweight bits and bobs, now weighs 1,570 kilos, but if you do 200 miles an hour, it weighs 300 kilos more because of the downforce. The engine hasn't been turned up as much as you might think for a final kind of mad run out special. 5.2 litres still, naturally aspirated, but 612 brake horsepower. So it's the joint most powerful R8 ever. And also not the fastest off the line. Because Audi's made this car rear wheel drive, for reasons we're gonna come back to, um, it's actually slower getting off a standstill than some of the Quattro drive R8s from the past. It actually takes this 200,000 pound special edition, 3.4 seconds to go from naught to 62 miles an hour. I suppose I've got time. I mean, I know it's an obvious place to start, but what an engine! Doesn't matter where you are in the rev band with the Audi V10, doesn't matter how much speed you're carrying or what gear you're in, it is so baleful, it has so much soul. It is just a glorious noise. One of the all-time great supercar power plants, it has to be. And it's kind of easy to forget that it's been around a heck of a long time now. I mean, started out life really with Lamborghini in the Gallardo and then doing service in the Huracan. And of course, the Audi have borrowed it and stuck it in 
well, four-door cars, the S6, put a couple of turbos on it in the RS6, but maybe the happiest home it ever found was in the back of an R8, where it also joined its great partner in crime. This twin clutch gearbox, once Audi finally did put an S-Tronic twin clutch in the R8, wow, it made a difference to the automatic shifts. I'm not saying it's better than the manual gearbox, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is if I have to use, if I'm forced to use horrible, cheap and nasty plastic paddles, come on Audi, really? Is that the best you can do? If I'm gonna have to change gear with paddles, then it might well be in here. It's just so perfectly matched to that savage engine. You get these seamless upshifts that if you have the space, brought a bit of a twisty bit now, but when the straights open out and you have the chance to hit the red line, just those flawless fast upshifts. Oh, it's just no interruption in the torque at all. And then when you are up at the high end of the gearbox and you want to come back down, I mean, we're in sixth now, get a load of this, fifth, fourth, third, second. The downshift lifts are spot on. They are just perfect. I mean, everyone loves accelerating, but you actually enjoy decelerating in here just as much. Now we might be rear wheel driving this R8, but traction, even though I'm on a patchy wet surface, there's puddles knocking around on this road as well. Lots of random patches of concrete and potholes, but it doesn't seem to be flummoxed by it. In fact, if there's anything that's really not raised its game for the R8 GT, I think it's the steering. I mean, it's fine, but it just doesn't have that gritty, granular, I'm a track special level of feedback you get from well, a Porsche 911 GT3 and quite a lot of McLarens. I mean, in a McLaren, you could argue that the great feelsome steering is really the headline act of the car. In here, we know what the headline act is. And I should explain that right now, I'm not just going for a lovely drive in the southern Spanish countryside. I'm driving to a racetrack, and that is critical, isn't it? That's crucial. In the Mark 1 R8, I didn't feel the need to go and find a racetrack. It's got 414 horsepower. It's got this sort of Goldilocks, just right sweet spot on the road. But the R8 has evolved. It is bigger and wider now. It is, frankly, a bit of a spaceship. You've got graphics and modes and settings and another 200 horsepower. And the fact is that as great as the noise is and the shifts and the body control and everything else, you do always feel that you are slightly being reined in as you are in so many supercars now. So you end up having to take them to the track to really uncork what they're all about. That does, however, give me the perfect excuse to try particular setting in here and it's this checkered flag rotary switch on the steering wheel the r8 gt torque rear mode and that's basically a sort of traction control initiated bootleg drift mode that's designed to unstick your r8 and prove that it could be a bit of a savage after all be totally irresponsible to use that on the public road so we'll go to the racetrack and we'll see how much of a power slide it lets me have before I run out of talent or it runs out of patience. But I can promise you that on the way, I won't use the radio. track ready Audi R8 GT on track. Oh, it still sounds good. But I'm afraid the rain in Spain falls mainly on the mid-engine 620 horsepower supercar. Yep, Audi have kindly brought British weather, so I feel right at home in the R8 GT. Come to Seville, southwest Spain, fantastic. Monte Blanco circuit, except, well, it's just been resurfaced. So it's like being in a greased bathtub out here. It is properly slippery. 
this RHET, you might be able to just see it's changed colour. I'm in a grey one now. And the reason for that is this one is a little bit more extreme. There's some choice optional extras on this car that if you're getting one of these RHETs, might I heartily recommend you tick all of these boxes. We have got proper bucket seats. If it's a track edition, you should get proper seats. So we'll check those, please. Next up, adjustable coilover suspension with 20 settings. This one has been slammed right down on the deck, so it wants to perform on track. The last mod on this particular R8 GT, he says, as he turns on the windscreen wipers to a faster setting, is the one you might guess. It's got sticky track day tires on it. It's got cup twos, and they really don't like the cold, and they really don't like the wet, and it's cold, and it's wet, and I've already put in some laps today, and I have got 30 degrees of rear tire temperature. So, as you probably expect, it doesn't particularly like the conditions, it doesn't like the resurfaced track, and it's quite grown up. So you'll have to bear with me, and we'll see just how we get on. <laughs> so this is the car in maximum guardian angel mode, and it's, well, it's looking after me, look here. Super slippery hairpin, loads of standing water, get the car put in and we'll just nail the throttle, and it's just giving me no throttle. There it comes, only when I got the steering wheel straight. Did you hear that? That's when it gave me the power. But, because it's 2022 and we live in a weird world, car makers, yes, they've spent years, haven't they, refining their traction control and their stability systems, their suspension to keep more of the tire in contact with the road, to make cars, even supercars, very, very easy to drive. Everyone's now trying to make the car scary again. And that's where this little knob down here comes in and it's basically a kind of selectable sense of humor so i've now got seven settings of how much torque it's called torque rear but that's not really not really what it's all about it's not changing how much torque's going to the rear it's changing how much the rear brakes are going to nip that power away depending on how big an accident the car senses i'm about to have and that all sounds very boring and very mathematical, I'm sure. So what I thought I'd do is come to a really slippery hairpin in setting one to start off with and show you. So I'll put the car in and it immediately goes about half a turn of lock sideways and again when you come out of the corner. And of course, this becomes addictive and you think, oh, I'd like a bit more of that. I'd like to see just how handy I really am. It's a very dangerous mindset to get into. So as we go up a click on the wiper speed, because it's really raining now, we'll take second gear here, setting two. And it's almost a full turn of lock sideways then, but it completely cut the power again, because it really felt like the car was gonna go around. So chuck it into this chicane here, bit of oversteer on turning, but then the car grips up. And again there, all of a sudden feels like the car's just getting angry. It's almost like it's losing its temper with you, going, okay, if you don't want my help, fine but you're gonna be more and more on your own. Don't come crying to me when you end up facing backwards. Well, it's not like Ferrari's side slip angle control. It's not that clever. It's basically just the brakes jabbing at the rear wheels and a little bit of cutting of the power when you give it a boot fall like that to try and save you from the worst of your oversteer excesses. I mean, it's good for a superhero mode. But this is even, this is setting one. I'm barely using any of the car's potential. I've got the assistance turned right the way up and it still wants to swap ends. So there you go. If you always felt that the R8 needed to be uncorked a little bit, that it needed to just let its hair down. Whoa, it has. So I guess we can't really say we've got to the limit until we end up facing the wrong way, can we? So let's just see, this is setting four, this is a very wet hairpin, and that is not coming back. And we end up balletically facing the way we've came. Of course, that was completely deliberate. I only did that to prove that you can still spin on level four out of seven. So there's still three settings still to go there. And I ended up gracefully pointing the wrong way. Still, it's handy for getting it turned back round. Now we're going to enter a different mode and this is called quit while you're ahead mode. It's getting really, really heavy out here and I'm going to go back to the pits 
and get a cup of tea. Well, at least it's um, dried out. Oh, I tell you what, my heart rate was definitely higher in the R8 GT. This is just the epitome of the clever modern supercar, isn't it? It makes you fast around a track. It can teach you digitally aided power slides and it will run Google Maps and warm your bum. So it's kind of the epitome of what Audi's become. Vorsprung, Dirch Technik, advancement through technology. And that's all very honourable, but I can't help thinking if the era of the petrol-powered Audi supercar won't be most fondly remembered for where the R8 started rather than where it finished. And cut. Okay, mate, can you just come help me pack things up? Okay, all good. I'm just going to, um, hang on, I'll, yeah, I'll be right back.